I'm really pleased here to announce Oscar Kuro. I, mm -hmm. I pronounce as well. Yes. Oscar is working at uh, KPN at the department of uh, CISO, the chief, chief Informa information security office. security office. Yes, yeah. and in there he's responsible for the technology strategy and policy. He works a lot with open source stuff. He's, but I understood he's always, you know. You all know that being in corporate environments, there are things that you discuss really in a certain way, and other things keep dark matter. But I think he's going to re reveal something that shows you that dark matter really matters. Yeah. One an applause for him. Please enjoy. First off, I'm not going to talk of or on behalf of my company. This is a slide deck that I've created myself, so disclaimer, disclaimer. I will only speak about generic problems that exist in all kinds of service providers and infrastructural providers. So uh, uh, you might see uh, uh, things that come along and see and look at the same or have a relationship with what uh, my company is doing, but this is a very generic uh, talk about the technology itself and what can actually come towards the, these kinds of infrastructural service providers. Playing defense is very complicated. There's a lot of details that go into uh, playing the defense. And one of the uh, things that the service providers and infrastructural providers actually uh, should think about as a baseline is that it's not a question if you get hacked, but when. A lot of uh, infrastructural providers don't actually take this posture. I think it's a bit of uh, an old-fashioned thing that everything should be pro secured from the get-go. Unfortunately, reality kicks in or should kick in sometime, and people will get hacked or get a problem to solve. There's a wide variety of attackers that could actually get towards or play around with your infrastructure. You can think of the individual hacker who has a personal motivation to just discover or run amok or whatever, positive or negative, that's not really relevant. To the infrastructural provider, it is of interest what does actually happen to the service. Will it go down because of some mockery, some playing around? We've, we've seen this here on the field itself. If you play around with some of the APIs that are open on our field and through the wireless infrastructure excellently provided, you can actually uh, uh, make the, uh, the things go boom, reboot, or something else. If this happens in a real life environment or in a bigger infrastructure, small problems could actually turn into a big massive effect. Then again, then you have the hacktivists. And the hacktivists obviously have a, have a different motivation to hack. We've seen this in 2003 where the DDoSs happened on, on two infrastructural providers uh, for banks uh, to make a statement. If you cut off the financial lines towards, uh, in that case, WikiLeaks, you will be uh, you know, some at the, uh, triggering some kind of effect. And in this case, the effect was in the form of a DDoS attack, volumetric attacks, just to flood the pipelines, and no uh, uh, activities could actually emerge uh, from, uh, from those links anymore. So it might look like just the front page is not active or not uh, available anymore, but the biggest problem could actually be that uh, something more actually happened when you DDoS the front website, because they share infrastructure, because they share the same pipeline, they, say, they share the same uh, VLANs perhaps or something else, and these are viable simple effects. And then you've got the cybercrime. I mean, these guys don't, uh, just have money in their minds and they will actually try to uh, try to hack an infrastructure or a service provider for premium services or for other kinds of services, whatever they offer, whatever is uh, of their interest. They could just use your machine for, for Bitcoin mining uh, or gain access to a Bitcoin mining facility and get all the goods, whatever they want. And then you've got the state actor, very complicated uh, attacker. Uh, they have a lot of time, they've got, they've got a lot of resources, and they can do a lot. They can also influence your supply chain, and in that case, all bets are off, because if they influence the supply chain, you definitely have a problem already before even you, you install the server. So there's a bigger, that's a very complicated uh, attacker 
uh, to actually deal with. There are ways of doing this, but it's really, uh, it, it takes quite some effort to get all the supply chain problems uh, into your hands and uh, have a lot of uh, reliable steps uh, after that and procedures in place to actually deal with those kinds of attackers. You see an interesting trend in the cybercrime activities. Um, and also you see uh, uh, an interesting uh, change into uh, what uh, normal people can actually achieve onto your infrastructure. Individual uh, script kiddies could actually launch a very significant flood and have a very interesting uh, effect on your infrastructure. This can make uh, it so that the service providers or the customers of a service provider actually go in, uh, get into the news because there was a breakage of some kind. And obviously the in simple statement that they make is the infrastructure was hacked or the bank was hacked. While it wasn't really hacked, it was just occupied with all kinds of other activities. Thank you. The criminals um, who use digital infrastructure uh, seem to be of a very diffuse uh, range. You have the petty thieves that just want to use simple tools to gain, uh, gain a foothold in your infrastructure and use it for different uh, ways, like sending, in spa sending spam, uh, use open relays, or do all kinds of other simple uh, things. But the other side of the, of the range of, uh, uh, of the uh, digital criminal uh, is just organized crime. They are very organized, they have means of getting uh, activities uh, spun up by uh, technical people. They buy exploits, they use exploits, they get people into their uh, community and actually start out uh, to be uh, of equal quality uh, what nation states could actually do, depending on how much time and effort or what kind of goods they can actually achieve and want to uh, achieve. The downside is that sometimes you see that these prices for DDoS attacks go down. And this even is an old slide. Prices are down, and, but the fun part is not everybody is actually paying any money because the DDoS uh, providers, the booter server providers, uh, will just have you use a test account. You can use a DDoS attack for just five to 10 minutes to test and see if the infrastructure of the DDoS facility is functioning according to specs of the buyer. If you are a student and you do not have any money, or if you are not even working yet, you can actually uh, look on these kinds of pages, get a free uh, test account, and with the free testing facility, you can already run amok on a service provider because they will test that you can actually send five to 10 or more gigabits a second uh, towards an infrastructure for just a few minutes. If you are on the response team side of a service provider, this means while uh, at the time that you realize that the monitoring is spiking up and you're making the calls, we need to do stuff, it might already be gone. So it's a very volatile attack. But on the other hand, it's also very fluent and can actually move away very quickly. So the prices might be, down, might be low, but not everybody's actually using this en masse. The testing accounts is actually the things that people are using, because then you get a new email address and you test again. And students might actually do this on their own school, because they don't want to make an exam. This has happened, this has reached the news even, and the service provider is picking up the pieces and needs to do stuff to keep its own infrastructure and other customers available. As a service provider, you see also a big change in the attack service. On the one side, we have a 19-inch rack facility in data centers, but nowadays we uh, see an expansion of the responsibilities of infrastructure into people's homes. People know about all the smart TVs and all the smart facilities, but if you are part of the infrastructure providing a video system or settle boxes or routers, or other facilities, or even an integrated, 
<laughs> interesting. Uh, or even an integrated solution uh, with webcams and an entire service around that. That means that you now just moved your service, not just from a telco uh, uh, perspective or service provider, but into people's homes. So now you have a responsibility also to take care of the other side of the network, which is just attached to yours. You didn't have any responsibility there. Legally wise, this is very interesting. You are now already by an okay of, a, of the user and acceptance of the user already present in their homes. And if your devices get hacked, you, are uh, you have a responsibility due to the duty of care rules, at least in this country, to attain and uh, service these boxes. This is something that we haven't seen before. Uh, this will happen uh, more often. But luckily, we do, we do have all kinds of security measures in place, but not everybody has it. And we've seen that, for instance, with the Mirai effect. This is uh, one of the, this was uh, earlier this year, uh, where the Mirai uh, botnet and, uh, made use of webcams. And webcams are these days pretty powerful devices. Some of the webcams can actually do 4K. Uh, video quality or HD, so there is quite some CPU power available. And these are very uh, very problematic effects. You have now uh, entered this problem that you are perhaps responsible for the devices or a service around devices created by a manufacturer on the eastern side of, of the world. And, in that and there they have a different quality setting, and perhaps you didn't pay attention to the quality of the, of the devices that you've integrated into several services, and then this uh, might be the effect that you are now part of the problem because of a, too, a low standard of security request to the vendor. This is something that happens a lot. It becomes a bit dangerous, more dangerous if the same effect happens when it's slightly closer to, heart, to your heart. Um, in the healthcare industry, you see a lot of developments where the service providers are moving into the healthcare uh, activities and make devices for doctors. So the uh, doctors can actually read out Bluetooth low energy uh, equipped uh, pacemakers and make a quality scan and upload the scan. Or if they have a stethoscope and the stethoscope measurements or, the, uh, or just uh, measuring your heart, and those measurements can also go towards a infrastructure. Now, it might always be enclosed and very secure, but there's always a, a, a moment in time where you fly or you transport your data uh, from the device, from the equipment, over the internet. Or if you are in an enclosed environment, it is just the, uh, you have a separate offline, or well, it's not really offline, but you have your own little network environment. This is also possible. But, uh, the thing is, if these kinds of uh, uh, measurements and data fly over the internet, what kind of protocol is being used? I've seen devices that were first introduced and used FTP. Think about it. This is technology from the 70s going into your high-tech, quality, new, modern device. A, uh, a practitioner has a cool new device created in 2016 and can now measure uh, heart, uh, informa uh, heart rate information, upload it to, uh, to a service, and that service uh, keeps track of the patient's information uh, or can it put it back into the patient's uh, file. Now, the backend part can be fully secured because of all the regulations. But what you don't uh, always see is what happened with the device towards the infrastructure. And Unfortunately, the oldest protocols are the easiest to implement. So you'll see a lot of recurring uh, problems in the newest devices that you see. So if you measure them, if you break them open, if you actually look, uh, look inside what's going on uh, in this particular device, you might actually have a, uh, uh, might actually have a uh, new problem introduced in the newest device. You also have new developments of infrastructure and service providers moving into a totally new field, something that people call either smart cities, although there's a bit of a misnomer. There are two types of the word, uh, explanations for the word smart cities. 
You've got smart cities where these kind of interactive moving devices are happening, and the other is processing of big data with multiple stakeholders and multiple organizations into one field. I'm now focusing on all the smart stuff that actually has interesting things like this. What you see here on the, on the picture is just a, a is that the, the, the vehicles can talk to each other, but what kind of protocols are they actually using here? Again, it becomes very interesting. Uh, uh, it looks very modern, it looks very sexy, but what kind of technology is actually behind this? I'm gonna go into that uh, in a few seconds. This is a picture of a cow. This is the connected cow. <laughs> what you can see here is a band, a necklace on the cow, and the cow is connected to a LoRa network, low energy, high range, and it measures um, what, kind of, what the temperature is of the cow, uh, where the cow is located on the field. So if you have a huge field, uh, now you actually know where the cow is, or if, the, if she went off field, where she went. Um, farmers are an interesting set of uh, people where they want to do as much as possible with the least amount of humans. So technology moved into farming quite early. You've already perhaps know about the, the earrings that you see on cows. Those are forbidden, if I'm not mistaken, due to regulations against animal harm. Uh, but those already had barcodes, and this was in the 90s. So now this moved up into NFC chips, and now we've got LoRa chips, so you don't, they don't even have to pass anywhere. They just, they just are connected as a hive in a kettle. There are different ways of, uh, of, of connecting all these kinds of examples. You've got Wi-Fi, you've got 5G coming up. Uh, 5G has a specific low energy spec specifically for a, a uptake of roughly 40 billion, 40, uh, 60 billion uh, devices around the planet in a couple of years, at least that's the prospect. If I'm not mistaken, it was 2025 for that kind of number. So there's a huge, huge amount of 5G devices that will move into the IoT devices because now you have the freedom of a phone, but now into your fridge or whatever. There are different types of Wi-Fi. We've had, we see the traditional ones that we have on our laptops, but there's also another spec. And LoRa is also very uh, upcoming, and very, uh, the, the low energy and the cost efficiency of LoRa makes it very easy to, easy to implement. The Bluetooth uh, we, we already saw, and obviously we still have old school Ethernet uh, still in all kinds of devices. Let's dive into the Wi-Fi. This is a spec that not everybody knows, but this is 802.11p. My laptop does A, N, B, G. Um, yeah, I don't have AC, unfortunately, not on this device. And this is the WAVE uh, spec, wireless access in vehicular environments. And what you see on this picture is that there is a car, and it might be connected over 4G or directly through this wireless protocol, which is more or less like a peer-to-peer -peer wireless protocol, between the car and the traffic light. So the traffic light will, actually, will now have a, uh, a, a fast binding uh, connection, and in that, uh, with that you can uh, send data to the traffic light. One of the purposes is for flow, uh, flow control with cars. If you have a traffic light and at a certain moment of the day you have a cool configuration where everything is flowing efficiently, but when traffic jams start and when you have the rush hour time, suddenly you have to shift the traffic lights differently. And now you can actually interactively speak from your car to the traffic light, which obviously is a pass-through to, or to another infrastructure that actually makes the decision, then moves down and uh, gives a, a hint that at least there's one car, two cars, five cars, or whatever. Or if you're a truck, then you have huge uh, occupants and it will tell the dimensions of the truck to the traffic light so that they know that you, this truck will take two spaces. 
And there's obviously a priority queue for police and for ambulances so that the green uh, traffic lights will flow perfectly for them. Why is this re relevant, especially for the priority devices? Each and every manufacturer of a traffic light system has a different protocol related to CAN bus or varieties of this on the inside uh, to actually shift it. So if you want to have a f uh, green flowing environment, like, okay, I've got three traffic lights uh, uh, connected to each other, you can chain them up and make a flow of, gr of green lights if you stick to the 50 kilometer speed limit. Um, unfortunately, this only went, well, works for one fender and for one installation. So now you have the freedom of having this uh, interconnectivity between all the traffic lights and, your, and smart traffic uh, throughout the entire country if you wish to do so. Also, if there is a, uh, a, a collision somewhere, you can actually get a hint that the collision happened f further away. Obviously, 4G, nice. I mean, the 4G protocol, good luck with cracking that one. That's still uh, a big, uh, bit, uh, big problem. Uh, if all the specs are implemented properly, I must add to that, because otherwise 4G can be vulnerable too, but in most cases, it's not so much. Um, but now you have a very open protocol that can speak 802.11p. Yeah, I could perhaps fake five cars, 10, 20, 100, and influence the traffic light in the way that I want. So I always want to have a green light. I also get annoyed if I, stay to, uh, if I stand there uh, too long, or perhaps I want to play an ambulance. So, Security in this system is very relevant because it could actually mean that uh, traffic jams could increase or even uh, uh, collisions could actually uh, be triggered by it. Because if you switch too fast between red and green or you influence it wrongly, you, have to, you still have and require all kinds of control systems. So this is getting pretty cool. Um, first demonstration is already live in the Netherlands with this system, but then only over the 4G not the uh, 802.11p, but that will be uh, more scalable and will be rolled out uh, in, a, in the coming few years when they actually finish the specification. Because the specification for this on how the traffic lights should actually communicate uh, behind the scenes is partially developed, partially not. We move up to another protocol, LoRa, or LoRa1, because LoRa is just a short name. Long range wide area network. If you look at the components on the left-hand side, you see pets and water meters and vending machines, and those can be connected to a gateway, to the wireless gateway, and it doesn't really matter how the traffic then is moved forward, but then it moves into a network uh, service and then towards an application server. The actual customer of a group of LoRa devices is at the application server. It's their application server. So you see three application servers in this example. This means three, typically three different customers. So LoRa is significantly different than 5G and other, uh, other uh, IP-related uh, uh, protocols because there's a LoRa protocol with more or less like MAC addresses. So it's, it, it's something like a two, layer two, layer three network that LoRa is composed of. It has encryption on two levels. You've got a network infrastructural provider uh, 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 protecting, protection, which protects you from the end nodes to the uh, base stations. So it's an encrypted with, uh, with a key of the uh, telecommunications provider uh, that actually provides this infrastructure. Unfortunately, the spec does allow, uh, like in other standards and specs, that this is optional, turned on. So if you look at one country's installation or one company's installation of LoRa, it might be secured and encrypted or not secured. It depends on what the infrastructure provider is willing to do with LoRa. Um, then, per application, you can have your own application key, app key, and this may scope the encryption between the, t the devices that you have. Like if you want to have all your refrigerators uh, from your company be managed over LoRa, you can have one key for those and one key for the others. Now, this already resulted into another problem 
key sharing and key, uh, and key management. If one of the uh, refrigerators is hacked, all refrigerators are hacked. So then you can influence the, 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 the encryption and therefore uh, run amok and play around with all the, all the devices. Um, the solution is, uh, is pretty heavy. Each and every device will have its own unique key. This requires key management, it's a lot of upkeep uh, for the infrastructural provider, but also for the user. Uh, this can all be uh, 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 pasted away behind an API, but that's what's really running behind the API. So if you really want to attack a LoRa device without hacking the LoRa network with a software-defined radio and running a mock, and you have to have a LoRa installation which is not encrypted, the, actual, uh, the, the biggest attack surface is actually at the application server because that is talking HTTP, HTTPS, APIs, REST APIs, or a uh, uh, SOAP API uh, to interact with the devices, uh, with the infrastructure. So if you want to, want to uh, attack or secure an environment, then, well, LoRa is pretty secure, to be honest, uh, but you have to take care about the application server because that's taking the control over your devices. Office, yeah, so it's, what you have to do is you have to match the freedom of using APIs and using uh, this type of environment uh, and be as reliable towards the customer and the user base as possible. This means that you really need to work on hardening uh, the devices and the infrastructure that actually is composing the uh, and up, upkeeping and working with the, uh, with the devices. So this goes into the software and the hardware of the IoT devices that you put in the field. And then you have to think about, okay, but what kind of security benchmark am I, am I using here? A fridge is significantly different than a car, but they might use the same protocol underneath. What type of methods can we share? Um, there are a lot of uh, experiences with subtle boxes for many years and uh, also with routers uh, where they uh, disable or remove certain control pins or management pins. Um, I think this community is mostly aware about uh, the existence of certain pins and certain uh, uh, pieces of, of the electronic boards that actually can reappear and re-emerge the serial interface to a device. If you have the serial interface to the device, you, have, you can actually gain access to a console, and from the console you can actually play, play around with the, uh, with the device yourself, and hopefully, uh, if you want to be, uh, depending on what your, what your role is, uh, interact with the device in new ways uh, that the infrastructure provider wasn't really thinking of yet. Like also reflashing the entire images on it and repurpose your device for something completely different, which is cool on one end, unless you are the infrastructural provider and you had a hope that the device uh, kept some keys or uh, needed to secure materials, whatever it is, identities, APIs, whatever, uh, and want to enclose this. So this is why infrastructural providers make it, in some cases, very hard uh, for you to open up a box or interact with the box, remove pins, not have any emergency, but, uh, emergency repair opportunities or serial interfaces. Uh, they would probably remove the entire UARTs uh, for this and just uh, uh, send you a new box because that's cheaper, but also more uh, better for the security of the infrastructure itself. So that can also be a motivation on why we just do a device swap or somebody does a device swap and not fix the device. Might have multiple reasons. Um, obviously, it's very inter inter important that you also secure the APIs, and uh, there are API fuzzers for this, and you can uh, uh, use uh, tools. Uh, fortunately enough, a lot of protocols are now uh, moving towards HTTP or HTTPS based, so a lot of the similar uh, fuzzers that you use for normal websites and normal ap uh, APIs can actually be used now to secure lots of these uh, IoT devices yourself. <coughs> Another detail, or totally different angle, is there's a push from the EU uh, to think and actually supply uh, device support statements. 
what can a user actually expect on the support for a device. If I talk to my wife or anybody else, then what's expected from a dishwasher or a washing machine? You should have at least five to 10 years of service or something else. For a car, that's even longer. There are some cars here running around who are still from the 60s, 40s, whatever. And is that something that we need to uh, 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 keep supporting for the end of days? Or when do we stop? And how do we tell this to the user? This is something that, is, that, that looks like, yeah, just put it down somewhere. But if you, just, uh, uh, if you take a bad example, like Apple, for instance, who makes a statement of, well, you have to have additional support uh, if you want to have anything beyond the first year. This is against EU law, so okay, we solve, uh, solve that problem. Uh, but you only have well, a typical one year, uh, everything goes support. If you would do a similar thing with a dishwasher and, and just say, okay, you only have the support for the first three years or five years, then yeah, that might be not the thing that you want if the, if the thing breaks down or the service board, the motherboard breaks down right after that. Um, different companies take different approaches. If I look at my Samsung 46-inch uh, 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 TV, features are dropping off per firmware update. There are all kinds of features in it. And because of the backend infrastructure that needs to be provided, at some moment in time, some of the APIs will just drop off. So my device does not have the ability to tweet anymore. I didn't use it, but it, I can't do it again. I, can ever, I can't even start doing it while it was on the box as a feature. Uh, several other uh, video systems and so on are also removed from that device. It's a strategy that works, and suddenly my smart TV went into a more or less smart TV with slightly cool features, but not that much anymore as it was in the beginning. So if you don't update it, uh, it'll, do, it'll just give you errors uh, on, on the functionality that were dropped off. I'm not really sure what will happen with a dishwasher or a car. Sorry, you can't turn left or, I don't know. Another nice problem that you see on the infrastructure side is how to deal with cryptography developments. And we have a lot of talks, especially in this community, about the developments of cryptography and when certain technologies and methods are not to be used anymore. How do you deal with that? You have to deal with Crypto agility, that really means that you can just update your software or move to a new technology. It becomes a bit hard when the technology is that hu overly huge different or uses more CPU load because it assumes that you moved your hardware with the time and developments of these new methods and technology. But perhaps this is not possible. In IoT devices, a lot of these methods are actually baked into hardware not with nice FPGAs, but in hardware itself. So if we would ever switch from triple DES or from uh, AES in some time in the future, a lot of devices will just have a huge problem because it might actually be baked in the hardware and that was your only, only, only technology and method that was ever possible. You have to swap the motherboard uh, to actually make a change to this. So in the future, when RSA would be, well, not so much cracked uh, uh, by theory, but quantum computers would be a commodity device, let's assume the future is 2025, 20, 2030, 2035, whatever the date is, is not so, uh, not so relevant on when the computer, uh, quantum computer would emerge, but certain technologies would be useless. But if you cannot update them, you have to throw them away. And if this is very relevant to a company that uses these kinds of devices for whatever security measure, then it's certainly you have a problem. Another thing is uh, obviously the, uh, the, the trust models. How do you deal with fleet control? How do you control them? You have to interact with them. Sometimes they're offline, sometimes they're online. What type of uh, technology can you use? What if the technology that you use is going, going bad as well? Um, and how do you set up a device? The device just got unwrapped. 
you put it on, you put it on power, it, it starts, it boots. How does the infrastructure know what type of device it is? While you perhaps didn't have any moment in time before this uh, to, uh, to uh, enable this device into your network. Um, so bootstrapping these devices is a, is a complicated thing. Um, an example here is written down. If, uh, so it, this is a, a recurring pattern that you see in all kinds of services. So you don't, uh, first you have the first stage, you don't have a, a proficient device. It becomes all active. It discovers the infrastructure on where it is. It starts out sending a DHCP request, perhaps, so it could be a completely different technology and does more or less the same functionality. It gets an ID and additional information from the infrastructure to, to do next, like a Pixie Boot or do something else. And based on markers, which might actually be pretty predictable, like MAC addresses, device IDs, or whatever, it starts booting up and then moves into a different stage. Um, often not used is a hardware en enclave, which may basically means there was already crypto material from the uh, uh, available uh, from, the, uh, from the industry and supply chain. This is something that you could do with SIM cards, for instance. SIM cards are actually smart cards. They actually have keys in them. The secure keys came from a manufacturer in a secure facility, and then you have the control over the supply chain again, and a unique ID that can even be challenged and checked. Because if this cannot be challenged and, sp and checked, you can spoof it. If you can spoof it, everybody can fake that this device and play around, perhaps with the fridge of your neighbor. Um, after this, you have the provisioning stage, and then the application starts working with the secrets that it, that it shoved around, and then uh, s suddenly uh, uh, something else uh, happens, and you move into the next stage. So if you think about it, the application data is actually protected by the application boot process and the integrity control that went into this, which started out with a provisioning that might be a dodgy implementation. So you can actually, if you can influence the provisioning stage, you can influence the uh, application boot and what kind of uh, uh, activity is going on on the device and the application data itself. So you can look at it like, okay, it's a bit of a complicated problem then, how do you solve this? Well, unfortunately, there are a lot of open questions here also. Uh, in the in sense of accountability. Uh, what is to be accountable for the service provider and for how long? And the end user just doesn't really care. It just says, well, I desire and I want to have my product and use it as it was actually sent, uh, sent to me. As, and as an interesting statement is obviously it still works, don't touch. I already mentioned that the uh, key management is a very complicated problem. Um, I would like to introduce the crypto turtle approach. I don't know if you know the it's turtles all the way down uh, statements. If not, look on Wikipedia. It's an inter interesting story um, where you see the, uh, the following pattern happening that if you have a key too secure or to manage because you have encrypted data, you want to encrypt the data, you have to deal with the key now. But if you do it properly, you would have the key on an encrypted storage device. Now, how do you encrypt the, the storage device? You yet again have a new key. And how do you deal with that key? And then if you just use it with, uh, just solve it with technology and don't st stop somewhere and make it a procedural problem, because people make it a procedural problem after this, uh, you will have a turtles all the way down. This key is protected by this key, protected by this key, protected by this key, and it all runs amok. You can see this in, uh, happening in databases and uh, hardware security modules. And if you secure everything to the max, you will have to think about business continuity management. If the key server goes down, if it dies, is the hardware security module broken, you're lost. Worst case, it's not just your service provider bit, but also the entire fleet control is lost. So if you, in the most absurd, weird effect, could mean that you just lost control over the support of millions of devices at home. 
it's a bit of a challenge to actually make sure that that doesn't really happen and that you have a reboot feature, but it really sucks if you have to send an email to 1 million people or 2 million or 5 million or 10 million to ask, please kindly reboot the device, because otherwise we can't service your device or work with your device in anymore. Another problem is yeah, all the keys in one basket. If you have one location, one device, well guarded, but yeah, if this one, if fire uh, uh, happens in this location, you have the same problem again. Uh, this also relates to public key infrastructure where we have a lot of faith into just a few root CAs, but that's a different topic and I will not move into this. People would say you could solve everything with quality control. Unfortunately, quality control is very complicated. And then, you're, then you have to deal with your suppliers and have to manage them. So if you actually have suppliers, you actually have to do active management. Because otherwise, it will be a garbage in, garbage out situation if you don't ask them, please make secure devices, please make secure services. Please create secure code. Please do something with this. Uh, often not used enough is that we could actually have influence, active influence on this. And uh, we could actually do more. And some of the companies do more and really challenge the suppliers. Um, but okay. Unfortunately, these suppliers are still using legacy protocols. This is just a, 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 a statement on Logjam uh, uh, from a while ago. And there are a lot of websites, but also APIs that are still using very old technology because somehow they couldn't really update it. And a bunch of these statistics aren't just Apache services that you can just update. Some of these results from Logjam are not just uh, websites that you should be able to just update with upget, update, or anything other uh, tool, uh, but uh, would actually be devices. Apache embedded in devices, which can only be updated by a firmware update, which is a very tedious and uh, specific problem to do. And yeah, not everybody is doing it. Unfortunately, uh, uh, not all vendors have created an update feature into their software. <laughs> Another funny uh, little thing is zombie vulnerabilities. Yeah, I called it. Okay, I just thought about it yesterday. Zombie vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities that you, that you have solved, but re-emerge. How the hell did that happen? I solved this. I had an update. I patched it. I got it into the infrastructure. I moved along. And I've, after a few months or years, Suddenly, exactly the same problem re-emerges. How does that happen? Let's assume you have a few companies, but the amount of companies is not really relevant, but you have to look at the main branch development of a piece of software. It develops over time, and it improves over time. But the first company had revision number one of, of this tool, but didn't say anything about it. Company B gets uh, the same revision of the tool. What happens in very large uh, software packages and software environments is that the company, the supplier, will branch off the source code for your company. That in your case, they can customize it for you. Because you might have a slightly different infrastructure than the other guys. You have different needs, and they can tailor make it. The problem of this tailoring is, so, uh, is that if company B states, OK, but we now need to do a patch on the software. The patch might be done and fixed in their revision. So their revision number one is actually revision number one for company B, not for company A, so that all the other companies don't actually get it because they didn't complain, so they didn't really have a problem, so why should we change it? Then the patch goes back into the main branch, but only appears way after it was deployed in many other cases uh, and might be uh, re emerging into, for instance, the. Uh, so it can actually happen that company B gets a revision number two and still doesn't really have the patch 
while company C moves, moves into revision number one again, and only that company could actually get it. So they're now only, in this entire picture, only company B that actually had the update in that branch, and only company C has the fix. So if you are company A and you got a newer version, um, like for instance company B, who actually made an effort into the security testing, and it got a new revision over time, it was only patched on the company B revision one branch. So you update, but unfortunately, the update actually re-emerges the same bug again, or whatever it was. This is a Windows in a forest picture. So in this case, you see an infrastructure of Windows systems in a forest of other, window, of other devices. I found it a really cool picture because it's a lot better than this one. This is where you have the typical Windows forest and segmentation situation. And if you're an infrastructure provider, you have to deal with this as well. This basically means that if you have a branch office, you have one user environment, and people can just use single, uh, single sign-on to log into uh, different pieces and areas of the infrastructure. It also makes uh, the chain of uh, HR to the uh, identity and access management, to the account management, and to your infrastructure very seamless. Very nice, but there are downsides. The single sign-on is very positive, but it connects all kinds of machines to one particular Active Directory. And multiple types of users uh, must be, uh, can be organized into multiple units. And if you don't really merge them, or if you merge them, you can't really distinguish between different users, so you really have to deal with those kind of situations. Because in some cases, you only want to be logged on, uh, have the single sign-on active in this part of the company and not in that part of the company. So if you think about NotPetya or other activities where logon actually was part of the spreading of malware or an attacker that actually moves into your network and then tries to do uh, lateral movement, uh, you will have to deal with this, and if you can segment your Windows environments properly, then the attacker has less attack surface to deal with and cannot jump from the office environment into your production environment, which happened in some companies. Another misnomer is that if you have different domains and the system administrators are different, if you have the domain administrators between the two domains, they could actually influence the domain that they have a trust relationship with. So if you have the single sign-on into multiple domains, yeah, yeah, I've got my users, they can use your resources. I've got my users, they can use your resources. These, that means you have two administrative domains, and these guys can actually uh, influence each other's uh, activities and influence each other's uh, resources and log on. <laughs> well, the phone's going off. <laughs> Another danger is that you have uh, perhaps uh, uh, a system that actually has a hybrid uh, setup of, for password storage. So the old Landman, NTLM, NTLM v2, if you have a domain that is top-notch, suddenly you can't even uphold this because you might need to uh, facilitate the single sign-on to an infrastructure piece of area that only has a different or older system of Windows running. It might be patched, it might be secured, but you still see that these kinds of effects happen in a large infrastructure when you have to combine multiple, uh, multiple systems, multiple domains. Um, and without uh, uh, filtering of, uh, of SIDs, uh, you, you can also uh, uh, control the other domain again because of you have these rights, because you make these trust relationships between these areas of the company. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's quite an architectural challenge and a technical challenge on how to separate this and still keep everything working. Because if you have your resources in one domain and you have to log on to this and your accounts are here, then it might actually work in one way, but you want to have a, uh, a, a segmented uh, environment as possible. But sometimes they, 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 they didn't really implement it properly and then you, you can't actually do the best thing for separation of your Windows systems. So, 
things left out. So this is the, fi the final, uh, final remarks that if you uh, do vendor assurance and uh, you can't think of the, uh, you have to think about the security posture of these. So if you have a supplier and it doesn't really matter if they're big or small, um, I've seen all of them, uh, single, uh, single people that can actually be very excellent in what they do and they're working in a company and they do tremendous stuff and you've got a big company of which you would think that they would have 100,000 people behind this one engineer to assist him, that doesn't really work. Suddenly re reality kicks in, they are just, uh, uh, the engineers are mostly just groups of people assigned to a particular company, and depending on the culture, they would actually ask out of the context of one company that they work for, and dare to ask, what, how do I solve this technical problem? And then it becomes a cultural thing. What kind of culture do you have? Do you stick to the plan? And will you just and only interact with your peers servicing this company? Um, or is, is, are these people actually having a help desk to actually ask, how do I deal with crypto problems, for instance? That's something that I have to deal with a lot. Like, how do you deal with cryptography in, the, in practice? And uh, it amazes me that people don't use Google often enough or don't just ask the colleague that already had to do the same thing in another company, for another company, sitting only one or two rooms next to them. Interaction and how people interact seems to be related to what kind of culture they have and what kind of sense they have on how to interact with people. So you can actually try to change the world if you want to influence this. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.